was the medieval emperor, like his ancient predecessors, the most powerful person in Europe? This supposedly easy question is frequently asked. The answer, however, is far from simple. There were emperors who had the most power. Others, on the other hand, were so weak that they have long since been forgotten. Who remembers Lothar III, for example? And who spontaneously knows that, strictly speaking, there was no Emperor Lothar II? In fact, the Emperor had so few official powers that he was constitutionally the weakest monarch in the major European countries. And the longer the Middle Ages lasted, the clearer this became. Let's take a look at the reasons for this and shed light on why there were still extremely powerful emperors. For the avoidance of doubt, I am referring only to the entity commonly known as the Holy Roman Empire, I ignore Byzantium. I start my reflections with Otto I, since his empire is considered to be the first typically medieval one. I ignore the Carolingians, because there would be so many special features to take into account that this video would have feature lengths. To understand what the emperor actually was, we have to go back to the days of the Roman Republic. At that time, Rome was not an empire, but only the city with a closed provincial system and a whole series of more or less independent allies. The entire Roman dominion was designed to serve the well-being of the city. To this end, the Republic had created an administrative system. Retiring officials in the city were given control over provinces or other tasks for a limited period of time. Julius Caesar, for example, was originally supposed to take care of forests and trails after his consulate. The provincial administrators acted as proconsuls. This meant they exercised the power of the consul instead of him. The consul was the highest office in the day of the Republic. He had two special powers that were important to the emperors. First, he was allowed to raise and lead an army. Second, he was allowed to impose capital punishments on Roman citizens. To prevent him from abusing this power, he, like the other Roman officers, had a colleague who could veto all measures. Occasionally there were consuls without colleagues, but this happened in the final phase of the Republic and will be the subject of a soon-to-be-released video that deals with this. These special powers of the consul were called empires or imperium in Latin. Originally an empire was the right to exercise a clearly defined power and only temporarily. The bearer of the empire was the emperor. The proconsul took this power with them for his province. This clear objective limitation of power distinguishes an emperor from a Roman dictator. For example, a proconsul could not completely dissolve the administrative system of a province, but he could certainly reshape it. He was also primarily responsible for defending against external enemies. In the last decades of the Republic, there were repeated crises that overwhelmed this system. Problems in Spain, pirates in the Mediterranean Sea or the Spartacus uprising in the middle of Italy are examples of this. The Republic responded with special empires. These were officially spatially limited but actually not really anymore. Pompey Magnus, for example, was given an empire for the entire Mediterranean to defeat the pirates. He was the most powerful official on the ground. Even the senate and consuls in Rome had little to no influence over what the emperor did. Even with Pompey, the system got into an extremely imbalance. The only time limit was that the emperor would hold the empire until he was supposed to complete his task. Pompey, Gaius Julius Caesar and Marcus Crassus finally broke the system as the so-called Triumvirat. They enforced empires without cause. Caesar, for example, became emperor of the provinces bordering the Gallic Rome. First for five years and then again for five years. When he abandoned this empire, there was no Gallic Rome left. Caesar rose to dictator after the civil war that followed. In the end, he was given this office for life. 
At the same time, he was granted sovereignty over all Roman dominions. Covertly, he was an emperor and the founder of the Roman Empire, but he didn't use this title. His heir Octavian was wider in this regard. He presented himself as the first citizen of Rome and refrained from aggressively using the title of dictator. It was too attached to Caesar's end. Instead, he was given an empire for the entire dominion, which was unlimited in terms of subject matter and time. In practice, this is almost indistinguishable from a dictator for life, but it works much better in the vocabulary that was acceptable in the Republic. Octavian, however, took Caesar's name and made it clear that he considered Caesar's titles and powers to be his as his heir. Incidentally, this also included the role of Pontifex Maximus, a title that was to be passed on to the Pope. The idea of a hereditary empire was born in this way. Octavian firmly linked competences from the Republican constitution to a person. The coup was that the political system as a whole did not need a major overhaul. The provincial system with its administrations was able to continue. The emperor intervened where he was needed or where he wanted to intervene. The second Roman emperor, Tiberius, spent his last years on Capri and ruled here only as much as he wanted. The emperors financed themselves through taxes and other levies. They controlled the treasury. Augustus had tax lists drawn up throughout the empire in which all inhabitants had to register. Anyone who owned real estate also had to submit what we now call an income tax return. The Senate, the people of Rome and the army were officially responsible for nominating emperors. The fact that this could also be different in practice is ignored for the moment. The fact is that for the medieval emperors there was basically only the title left, there was no longer a Senate and the people of Rome were not a decisive factor even in late antiquity. A Roman army did not exist either. The provincial administrations no longer existed in their previous form and the tax system had also collapsed. The only structure that had really survived from Roman times was the church. Bishops took on administrative tasks in many places, which is why they also became secular princes in the Middle Ages. These explanations show that the title of emperor was a soft power in the Middle Ages. It did not give any clear competences. Instead, it described a virtual superiority of the incumbent over other rulers. Firmly attached to the title of emperor was that of the German or Roman king. He was elected by the German princes and was the only contender for the imperial crown. Whether he actually received it depended on the pope. He performed the coronation and was able to reject it. There were occasional attempts by non-German princes to become emperor or to secure the German royal crown in order to become emperor. However, such projects always failed. After their imperial coronations, many emperors began to have their heir elected as king in order to secure the dynasty. To some extent, however, they did so even when there were still kings. It was not necessarily the case that they had to be emperors to have a king election carried out for a son. The medieval rulers had to replace the provincial system with their own administrative solution. This was true for the emperor as well as for the kings on the continent. Feudal systems were the solution that prevailed. In the empire, the power of the princes was particularly great as they naturally had a strong influence. After all, they were the ones who elected the king. Politically, the feudal system in the empire functioned in such a way that the king or emperor enfeoffed a prince with the dominion. He lent it to him to manage it on his behalf. Unlike a proconsul, such fiefs were set for life. In theory, they could be withdrawn, however, this happened only very rarely. The king or emperor was the supreme magistrate and traveled around administrating justice. A permanent imperial army did not exist. The princes were to raise troops if necessary and place them under the control of the monarch. The emperor or king wasn't completely helpless in this regard. The princes naturally chose one of their own as monarch. The monarch thus had a so-called household estate at his disposal. 
This refers to his dominion, which he held as a duke, for example. From the 11th century onwards, all rulers came from the south of the empire. In the north, the emperor was losing more and more influence. Overall, the princely rule became increasingly stronger. Kings eventually had to agree that fiefs became hereditary. Their jurisdiction had also been significantly curtailed. Officially, they were also the supreme legislators for the Reich. In fact, however, they could only have laws passed with the consent of a Reichstag, meaning an imperial assembly. And this rarely succeeded. The princes, on the other hand, were able to exercise much more extensive power in their dominions. Within the empire, therefore, almost independent partial dominions emerged. For this reason, maps of the Rome looked like a patchwork kilt. In German historical scholarship, this process is referred to as territorialization. One of the reasons why the king or emperor became weaker and weaker at the expense of the princes was the precarious financial situation of the empire. It was practically always close to bankruptcy. There was no tax system like in the ancient empire. The princes collected taxes in their dominions and used them to finance themselves. Theoretically, a Reichstag could decide on special taxes for the empire, which would have to be passed on from the princes to the monarch. However, history has shown that when people are asked to decide that they have to pay taxes themselves, they are very reluctant to do so. The empire was no exception. There was therefore another instrument for financing the Reich, the so-called Reichsgut, meaning imperial estate. These were possessions that were directly subordinate to the monarch and whose proceeds benefited the imperial treasury. However, the rulers had such great financial needs that these returns were far from sufficient. Again and again they had to pledge imperial property for loans. The situation became even more problematic during the Interregnum. That means the time without an emperor in the middle of the 13th century. The princes secured almost the entire imperial estate during that time. The king or emperor had to make do with the resources of his household estate. If they were well equipped in this regard, they could still be powerful. Otherwise, they were largely reduced to ceremonial powers. In addition, the relationship between the empire and the papacy had been deteriorating since the 11th century. Originally, the emperor had precedence. He was the defender of the church. This was now changing. With the pope, there was a person who could decide whether a king became emperor or not. He also claimed the right to remove kings from office and demand new elections. The relationship never got really good again. The conflict lost its tension because both sides lost power. Nevertheless, the very existence of the Pope meant a limitation of imperial power. Overall, therefore, the power of the Emperor depended on the specific person. The extent to which this is true is shown by the examples of the Emperors Henry III and Henry IV. They were father and son. Both ruled in succession in the 11th century. Henry III was one of the most powerful emperors of the Middle Ages. His father Conrad had endowed him with the duchies of Bavaria and Swabia and made him co-king at the age of 10 or 11. Henry, for example, was able to annex the independent kingdom of Burgundy to the empire. But nowhere was his influence more evident than in connection with the popes. He appointed several popes. No one could seriously endanger him. However, Henry III died in 1056. His son Henry IV was only six years old at the time. Although he had already been elected co-king at the age of three, he was for obvious reasons unable to manage the business of government at the age of six. His mother Agnes ruled for him, but only for a few years. Some princes kidnapped the boy in order to take power themselves. This succeeded and considerably weakened the kingship. It was not the first time that one of Henry III's children had been kidnapped. Already his daughter Mathilde fell into the hands of Rudolf of Rheinfelden, who demanded the Duchy of Swabia for the child. 
One of Henry's kidnappers was the Bavarian Duke Otto of Nordheim. The relationship between the young king and the prince was never to be good. Directly after the moment Henry IV had reached the age of majority and took over the imperial government, it was only with great difficulty that he could be prevented from attacking Otto with his sword. In the years that followed, there were repeated uprisings against Henry. Otto was always one of the leaders. Henry had to endure the fact that two rival kings were elected against him. In addition, his own sons also rebelled against him. In the conflict with Pope Gregory VII, he completely lost power. The Pope excommunicated him and had to force him to the legendary penential walk to Canossa. Henry had to beg for three days in front of the Alpine fortress for admission and forgiveness. The peace between the king and the pope lasted only a few years. This time Henry tried to depose the pope and have a new pope, Clement III, appointed. The last part somehow succeeded. Clement even ruled in Rome and crowned Henry as emperor. Gregory, however, remained the pope recognized by the masses. One of his successors was Urban II. This, by the way, is also the reason why the call for the First Crusade did not take place in Rome, but in what is now France. Henry's Pope Clement still resided in Rome. Even the princes no longer followed the monarch's commands as they once did. Henry IV was de facto confined to a narrow stretch of Italian territory for two years because the princes of the adjacent territories not only did not want to let him pass, but would probably have arrested him immediately. He had hardly any real power during this time. The emperor, as the ruler of the empire, was only a theoretical idea by the end of the Middle Ages at the latest. In fact, he was a regional ruler who had to rely on his own base, and when it was large, as in the case of Charles V, for example, he played an important role. The merely virtual primacy of the emperor instead became part of the German national self-image. The idea behind the emperor was a more powerful ruler than England or France had. This, by the way, is also the reason why the Germans use their version of the name Caesar with Kaiser to describe the office and not speak of Imperator. It was about remembering the ideas associated with Caesar's name and not about the loss of significance of the role in the Middle Ages.